Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today's show is a special joint production of the University of the District of Columbia and the University of Cape Town. I'm here in Cape Town, South Africa, where we'll be talking about student life at universities in South Africa. Sharnel Cater is a first-year student at UNISA, the University of South Africa. Cater is an aspiring youth development worker who is currently a volunteer at the YMCA in Cape Town. Daniel Silk is an independent political analyst and a former city councillor. He lectures regularly about post-apartheid South Africa and societal changes since 1994. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Cater, maybe if we could start with you, since you're a student, if you could say a word or two about why did you choose to go to UNISA and how did you get there and how do you finance it? Okay. Um, to start or simply, we don't all have money <laughs> to go study. So I chose UNISA because it's an open distance learning place. I am able to not necessarily work as per se because it's a lot of subjects that I'm doing and a lot of modules, but it's easier because I get to earn a little bit money along the line so that I can fund what I'm doing. I did take out a loan because unfortunately there isn't money you know, depending on where you grow up. And I think a lot of youth face this problem constantly. And I specifically chose UNISA because I am able to say study and I am working or volunteering in a place where I am able to gain experience. Because what I've noticed in the years that have passed by, a lot of students complain that they have the experience but they don't have the diplomas or they have the diplomas and they don't have the experience and either way you don't get that money because of that so i think the way i have chosen it it was because it f it suited my needs well um, mostly yeah well fair enough and you said you, and you volunteer as well yes the volunteer work that i'm doing because i do youth development or i am studying to do youth development i work in the ymca and the ymca is a platform where we work with um, lots of different groups. We work with um, the Portsmouth Prison. We have another program that we um, run and we work with kids in disadvantaged communities. And then we have the one that we have St. Joseph's um, at St. Joseph's Hospital. And we basically help them like they chronicle ill kids and then we give them a program also. So we give and offer a program and Basically, I gain experience from doing that. And at the same time, I work, I can implement what I'm doing or what I'm studying. So if, say, my project is um, I have to organize a health education type of tour thing, then I will maybe go to St. Joseph's and get my group involved and then say, listen, this is the program I'd like to do. And I propose it to them and then we'd set it up and we'd go forth like that. So I am studying. I am gaining experience and I am also kind of making a little money because we don't get a lot, but we kind of get a stipend sometimes depending on if it works out. And we do a lot of fundraising also. But I think that is like the only way ideally you as a student can eventually get that ideal job. Because like I said, you have that problem with you don't have experience and you have a diploma. If you don't have a, dip um, you have a diploma and you don't have the experience. Well, fair enough. Uh, Daniel, in your experience, is what caters experience uh, happening throughout South Africa where students have to work and go to school and volunteer to kind of propel their careers? Yes, I think so. I think there's a competitive job market in South Africa, but in fact there are not enough jobs in South Africa as well. So there is pressure on students, uh, those taking university diploma courses, to really gain as much experience as they possibly can. Uh, we have a very, very high unemployment rate in South Africa, and it's extremely difficult for uh, students, young people in particular. It's not unusual, of course, it applies across the world, but in South Africa, our, our overall unemployment rate is at least 25%, and that's conservatively put, probably well over 30% for that matter. So any additional experience, any additional uh, vocational training that a student can possibly 
possibly muster is clearly of value, but it still doesn't guarantee a job at the end of the day. Uh, we are uh, in a severe crisis in South Africa in terms of having sufficient jobs and growing our economy sufficiently in order to cater for young students who are coming onto the job market. And I think it's a, it's a, we had, we had a, we had a critical stage in our development where there is a certain disillusionment as well amongst young people when looking for their job into the future. And we in fact see that disillusionment borne out in the attitudes of young people towards uh, political parties, their participation in the broader South African society. Mm. Fair enough. Um, Cater, I, I know that you were born in 1991. Yeah. If I had that right, I hope yeah. I'm not sharing a no, secret to the world. Uh, but uh, South Africa changed considerably in 1994. Yeah. And so maybe you could both talk about what 1994 means to both of you. Well, for me personally, I have never really experienced the apartheid and speaking because I do general research every single day. Even those that have been born in 1980, they can't really speak about apartheid such as what I can speak about and I'm sure many other youth can speak about is that history that we have learned there's some stigma that is attached with um, discrimination because you see it and I think it's um, like me and Daniel were speaking earlier it was something to say about that's human nature it, it just is that way I can see there's a lot of changes one because I know the history of our country and one because I can see where it's going towards I just feel that it is not moving as fast as I'd like it to be because what is it, what's happening to us that is struggling still? You know, they are giving us this picture, and I'm not specifically saying government itself, but there's a picture being laid out for us that this is what we'd like for South Africa. This is what we'd like to happen. But it doesn't seem like when you put it on paper, I mean, it's just on paper, but it's nothing more than that. You don't really see it being put into um, communities or into organizations. And maybe it's just because we're not educated enough about it, maybe because we don't know where to go. That could be the reason. Or maybe it's just not because it's, because it's not there, you know. It's kind of uh, one way to. <laughs> Look, uh, Steve, on, on, on the broad front since 1994, I think what we have provided South Africans is accessibility to education. You must remember, prior to 1994, uh, the old uh, racist way of dealing with South Africa's educational system prevented black South Africans uh, from uh, entering universities and entering particular fields of study. So uh, accessibility, of course, is the big gainer. Every South African now has the potential to go to a university. Well, certainly, they've got the, the, it's their right to receive schooling and then go to a higher educational institution and study whatever course that they uh, are qualified to study. That's the a big plus. Um, but accessibility doesn't really uh, mean we are seeing results uh, at the end of the day. Uh, what we see in South Africa now is a, um, a relatively high, uh, we have a high school dropout rate which is of great concern. So those students who pass our final end of year matric examination, um, those are the good ones. Uh, in the two years prior to that, uh, the grade, between grade 10 and grade 12, we have a very high dropout rate of students in our schools. Those that eventually do pass at the end of the school leaving uh, a year, uh, they often are ill-equipped to deal with their first year in university and we therefore have a very high dropout rate in uh, the first year mm -hmm. of our universities. Uh, this is a critical problem. We have very high matriculation rates or school leaving, leaving rates in South Africa, but that doesn't take into account those kids who've dropped out during the process. And it doesn't uh, take into account those kids who don't make it in that first year of university. So uh, whilst we have accessibility for students, what we don't necessarily have is quality schooling for mm. our South African kids. Um, and we spend a lot of money. Uh, our national budget spends a vast amount of money every year on schooling, one of the largest in proportion anywhere in the world. And yet we do question in South Africa whether we get value for our RANDs when it comes to uh, uh, the outcomes of our, of our school kids. May I add something to that? Um, and that is so true what you are saying. I work with kids every day. So we have 60 kids. We provide this home um, after school. We have two hours. We help them with homework because the parents can't always get to it. 
And what I've noticed, I saw this one boy's report and I, I constantly say, listen, I want to see your report so I can see if we have made progress. And I got his last, year, his, um, last year's report and he was in grade five. And he got zeros, I was like, um, you get code. So our code is one till seven and he got a code one for all four terms. And he was progressed over to grade six. I think the last term he got maybe a two in Afrikaans, a code two in Afrikaans, and that's what 30, no, I'm actually lying, it's 30% maybe, I'm not exactly sure yeah. what the code is, but it's very, very low. And they progressed him to grade six. We are now struggling with him to read. We have another boy, he's in grade three, and he's struggling to read. It's simple stuff, but this is what happens. Um, I'm quite sure that if you are in a certain level, you can't stay behind longer than a certain amount of time. So what happens is teachers push over the students, push over the students, push over the students. And then when it comes to matric time, or when it comes to grade 10, high school, you're seeing so much dropout, so you're seeing the statistics that it's so low. But it starts because when the fundamental or the foundation phase is brought up, they are not teaching the children to read. They are not teaching the, the proper numeracy. They are like just pushing them on because they don't want to deal with that kid. Well, and it makes it very difficult for us when we're looking further. Well, fair enough. I mean, that's an interesting point. Uh, I, we, I think we only, only have another minute or two of this part of the uh, segment. But in terms of UNISA, are you happy with the education that you're receiving? We were just talking about the education for younger kids. But are you happy with your education? With my education, personally? I get to say when I study and you have to be determined yourself. You understand? You have to know where you want to be. But if you don't have good role models around you and if you don't have good people around you, and that is what a lot of our youth is struggling with, they don't have their good mo role models to tell them, hey, this is what you need to do to get somewhere in life. And luckily I've been fortunate enough to have that. So yeah, I struggle, but I have a support system and I make sure that, like I spoke to Daniel and I'm like, hey, can I do this? Because I know it's along in my um, work of line or what I'm studying. And it's something that I'd like to do personally, you know. So I think it's great. But because I had role models in my life, it made it easier for me. And why don't I give you the last word on this, Daniel? How did your UCT education help you? Well, it helped me. I mean, it was uh, our universities, I actually believe, other than my own personal story, I, our universities are world class and they offer fantastic opportunities for young kids. Remember, 60% of South Africans, 50 million people in this country are under the age of 35, 60%. So we've got a huge pool of talent in this country. Many of them drop out and don't make it. But many of them, and you can see right here with me, do make it. And that's why I think our universities absolutely do cater for a broad range of students. Uh, my days at uh, UCT were outstanding. Uh, fantastic education, superb administration. Uh, I received a world-class education, and I'm lucky. But then I could take advantage of that because I had a good schooling and a good background, and I could really integrate into UCT. And I think that's really what the message is. It's a, 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 there are a number of blocks in the equation of higher education mm. um, and perhaps in the South African case we've got some work to do in building all of those blocks together. Thank you Cater, thank you Daniel, that was terrific. We're going to take a quick break where you're going to see images of what has enabled us to work together to put together this project here in Cape Town, South Africa. And after the short break what we're going to do is we're going to have two guests from the University of Cape Town who will be speaking about film and media studies at the University of Cape Town. Our South African studio segments were filmed in the UCT studio in Cape Town, South Africa. The crew consisted of UCT students, students from other educational institutions, and aspiring filmmakers who do not have access to a film school or a university. For most of the participants, this outreach training program was their very first introduction to multi-camera studio production. They received input on skills such as set building, camera, sound, vision mixing, and directing, I trust that you will agree with me that they did a very professional job. Thank you very, very much. Welcome back. Tembalitu Mfebe is a third year student in the Film and Media Studies Department at the University of Cape Town. Temba is an aspiring filmmaker who comes from Velcom and Johannesburg. Colleen Knox is a second year student in the Film and Media Studies Department at the University of Cape Town. Before coming to UCT, she was a ballet teacher in New York City for three years. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for having us on the show. Well, it's a pleasure. 
Well, Temba, what brought you to UCT? Well, UCT is one of the best uh, universities in, in South Africa, so that alone pulled me in. So I applied to UCT, I applied to a few other places, got accepted, and when I got the choice, I obviously picked the best university for me in my eyes. So that's how I got to UCT. Well, if you don't mind me asking you something personal that we shared before we came on mm -hmm. the set, you told me, if I understood you correctly, that you were too rich to get certain funds, but too poor to qualify for other funds to come to UCT. Yeah, um, UCT is one of the best schools, but it's, it is quite pricey. And applying for financial aid at the university, you have to meet a few prerequisites. And my family income put together is higher than the quota because uh, that fund is, is designed for underprivileged students who can't. So I can't apply for that. But also, um, my family income is not high enough to carry on funding my studies. So it's, it's not just my problem. I'm pretty sure like a lot of people in South Africa have that problem as well. But yeah, but I'm still studying. I'm just fortunate enough to still be affording it. <laughs> Excellent. And Colleen, I know you're in a slightly different position because you're a returning student. Yes. So can you say a word or two about what brought you back to school at the age of, I'm not going to say what it is unless you <laughs> feel like sharing your age on air? You can say it. Uh, I'm 28 years old and uh, this, is, this will be my second qualification. So I'd always planned to study again and uh, I was waiting for the right moment and also waiting for a moment when I could afford it. And obviously because I already have a, a qualification, I can't ask my parents for money because they wouldn't be willing to pay for it. So uh, I have been paying for my, my studies myself, which has been, it's been quite pricey and I've been working at the same time. Uh, but I started again at UCT because I've been working as a ballet teacher, I've worked as an actor as well. But obviously it's not something I'm going to be able to do forever. I'm not going to be able to dance until I'm 50, uh, although I'd like to. Uh, so I'd, I'd planned all along to study again and that's why I'm, I'm coming back to university to sort of plan for my future career, I suppose. I just want to get to something for a second that you said. So you're saying after 50 people can't dance? Well, people can still dance, but the, I'm pretty sure no one's going to pay them to do it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, in terms of that, there is a serious aspect of that, which is the issue of, of jobs. We talked a little bit about this in the other segment, in the first part of the segment. But I'm interested in how you both think your education here in Cape Town is going to help you in terms of jobs afterwards. Well, as a UCT graduate, when I do graduate this year, I'll look good on my CV. So I'll be able to knock on doors. It, it gives me a certain amount of credibility. So they will know that I've done three years of, of what I've been doing. But then again, also sometimes a degree isn't enough. You still need uh, work experience. And some places won't give you a job unless you experienced but you can't get a job you can't get experience if you don't get accepted to jobs so it's like a cycle that's hard to break but yeah it helps a lot if you have a degree but what what do you what are you planning to do exactly what, what is your ideal job that you would have the day after you finish school the day after I finish school i do job just have a production company for myself direct my own films produce my own films but that's like a long road ahead. So I know, got to start off small, knock on doors, do any job I can in the, in the film industry. And do you think UCT has prepared you for these roads? And maybe if you can say a word or two about the courses that you've taken and the preparation for an American audience who may not know much about this department or may not know much about the University of Cape Town. Shall I take this one? Um, UCT, as we've already established, is a really, really well-respected university. And I feel like the courses that I've taken so far are really preparing me for what's, what's going to be coming. We've, we do a lot of practical work. A lot of our assignments are based on things that you're going to be doing in the real world once you're done with your, with your qualification. And then on top of that, UCT, for those who are willing, also offers a lot of sort of holiday experience work. So, uh, for instance, I'm in the film department and so is Temba. And we've been working on things during our, our university holidays, um, working in studios, making documentaries, doing all of that stuff. So we are both going to leave with really good portfolios, which will then help us to get work in the real world. And it's not just uh, practical work we do, because uh, we also 
because we are in the humanities faculty. They teach us uh, reading skills, research skills, because we're doing essays and all those kinds of things. So we get a more all-rounded education when we go out. So it's not just the practical. Mm. Fair enough. In terms of your lives a little bit, could you explain where do you live? How do you get to school every day? What's your day-to-day -day schedule? Well, my first two years I was in res, uh, it's a residence. Uh, I lived on upper campus, so I didn't need transportation. And this is my third and final year. I moved out of res, too old for res. So I'm living in Cape Town. And I drive down on my bike. There's also uh, UCT offers a free jammy shuttle from town and uh, the neighboring uh, suburbs where students go from and you can just hop on one and go to campus for free. I uh, live alone in an apartment close to the university, which is very helpful in the summer because it's a really nice walk up to campus and pretty good exercise in the morning as well. And then in the winter, I'll take my car to wherever the jammy buses um, that Tembo was talking about stop and I'll just take a bus up to campus because parking, parking is quite scarce. But uh, if you plan ahead and time your, your journey well, you can get up to campus easily. Would well, you mind if I pry into your personal lives a little bit more? Can you tell us what your lives are like as students here in terms of who you deal with every day in, in a little bit more detail? Can you go first? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my student life, I think, would be a little bit different to, to Tembo because I'm a little bit older. So it's been interesting for me being on campus and being a little bit older because people seem to think I'm a lecturer at first, which is quite funny. <laughs> and then they realize I'm a student and then the questions come about, you know, why I'm studying. There seems to be sort of a a culture of very young students being at UCT. So I have come across one or two other more mature students, I suppose you'd call us, um, which has also been very nice. But I, I have made a lot of friends on campus, which has been, it's been great. Well, I guess as a young student, and I never took a gap year straight from high school. Um, most of our time is spent up, like trying to keep up with the work and the workload is way much more different from when you're in high school. And it's not just all work work. Sometimes we, there's always a time for a bit of play, meet a lot of different people at the university that you're usually not open to, meet a lot of new friends. It's uh, quite a different experience. Well, you mentioned the gap year. That's actually an interesting uh, subject in the United States. There's some controversy about that. Uh, I often like to talk about gap years, but a lot of families are not excited about their kids doing gap years because they're afraid they'll get off the track, yeah. whatever that track is. Yeah. How do people in South Africa look at that? And how do students in South Africa look at that? Well, I'm just assuming and generalizing, but I think the gap year is seen as a waste of time because from a trick, you'll just be sitting at home doing nothing. And sometimes when the uh, young students who just matriculated do find a job and then they start making a comfortable income, they, they'll abandon their pursuit to study further. So also parents don't want their kids to move away from studying because studying seems like you get better life chances. I actually have something to say on that because my younger sister started studying at the University of Cape Town. She got into the fine art program, which is a really, it's a difficult program to get into and it's quite prestigious. She took part in the program for a year and then decided it wasn't for her. Went overseas and she was paid for two years and had a, a lot of fun in the States, studied while she was over there and decided that what she really wanted to do was sound engineering. And now she's come back and she's in her second year of sound engineering and she's doing incredibly well and she's really happy. So I think it depends on the person. I think people, some people need a little bit of time to figure out what it is that they want to study. And I think in that respect, a gap year is a really good idea. Well, that's interesting. Well, let's say you were having a discussion about this with a group of, of students, not just you know, two students. Do you think there would be a, a wide variety of opinions or would people look at you funny if you said that, you know, if your sister were, was here right now, would people say, well, that's kind of strange? Not really. I think I know a lot of people, even at UC2, who maybe didn't take a gap year, but they've come into first year done the courses that they thought they wanted to do and then they've changed to something completely different, which essentially would be the same thing as a gap year except they've spent their first year studying something that they don't want to use. So they'll come to university, they'll take a couple of courses and who knows what, 
and then decide that it's not for them and switch to a completely different faculty even sometimes. Well, fair enough. I know we only have another minute or two to go, but maybe if we could say a word or two about, if you don't mind, about the finances. I know we covered that a little bit before, but how are you piecing this together and do you have any advice for students who are thinking about coming here in terms of how to finance their education? Um, just research really hard uh, on who would fund you, especially with what you're studying because some, some things are more attractive to companies like if you were to do commerce, a lot of uh, banking companies, uh, firms will would uh, uh, fund you and then you go work for them but some of them not that uh, attractive you know what I mean yeah for me it would just be especially if you're paying for your own fees as I am to just keep in mind all the time that you need to put your studies first because it's often tempting to to try to work and work and work to make the money to pay for the for the courses but if you lose sight of what it is that you're actually studying your your academics go way down well fair enough thank you Temba thank you Colleen if you would like additional information about the YMCA in Cape Town, Daniel Silk, or the University of Cape Town, please visit ymcacapetown.org.za or danielsilk.com or uct.ac.za. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.